what is a supercapacitor, how does it work and how is it made. Today we will look into this particular type of energy storage and we will answer these and other questions. At the University of Southampton we made a number of aqueous supercapacitor coin cells. The term aqueous refers to the use of a water-based electrolyte. Here you can see a common industrially made supercapacitor. You may look at it and think of a battery and indeed there are some similarities. Both devices come in similar sizes and can be used in similar applications, although they have very different strengths and weaknesses. Compared to a similarly sized battery, supercapacitors have a greater power density, hence better charge and discharge rates, as well as a longer cycle life. On the downside, the self-discharge is higher, while the energy density is much lower. The supercapacitors can be used wherever we need a large amount of power for a short period of time. This could be for cordless power tools, a camera's photographic flash, or on a larger scale to support the national power grid at times of peak demand. Due to the long cycle life, they are also very useful in applications with many charge and discharge cycles, for example when you try to integrate regenerative braking into an electric vehicle. So how does a supercapacitor function? First, let's consider a regular capacitor. A capacitor stores energy by separating charge to induce a voltage. In a parallel plate capacitor, this is done by charging opposing plates separated by a dielectric. Unlike batteries, no chemical reactions occur during operation, so capacitor lifetimes are typically higher. Capacitance is a measure of the device's ability to store charge and is given by the equation on the screen. It increases with increasing surface area and decreasing charge separation distance. Supercapacitors have an electrolyte between the plates rather than a dielectric. Our supercapacitors have carbon electrodes, so charged by the formation of electrical double layers. Double layers are formed when ions in the electrolyte are attracted to an oppositely charged electrode when an electric field is induced across the device. The double layer consists of two layers. The Helmholtz layer is made up of a dense layer of ions separated from an oppositely charged electrode by a layer of solvent molecules. The diffuse layer consists of ions diffusing to the Helmholtz layer boundary. The Helmholtz layer dominates the capacitance and can be thought of as a parallel plate capacitor where D is the thickness of the solvent layer. The very small D helps explain why supercapacitors have higher capacitances than capacitors. Overall, supercapacitors can be represented by an equivalent circuit consisting of two capacitors in series with a resistor. The capacitors represent the double layers and hence the energy stored in the system. The resistor represents the internal resistance resulting from diffusion and hence energy losses. So now we know how a supercapacitor works, let's see how to make one. The construction of our high surface area electrode involves the deposit of high surface area carbon black onto a current collective pile. To do this, we mix a polymeric binder, which is PVDF, with the carbon black in an NMP solvent. This creates an ink which can be deposited as a thin film onto the current collective pile. The materials are weighed, firstly, the PVDF binder, then secondly, the carbon black. The PVDF is then dissolved into the NMP solvent. This requires vigorous mixing and sonication. Once all the PVDF is dissolved, the carbon black is added to the solution. Here again, repeated mixing and sonication is used until a homogeneous ink is formed. When the ink is formed, it can then be deposited as a thin film onto current collecting foil. After the film has dried, a sheet of electro material has been made. A punch is then used to give a circular electrode which can fit inside of a coin cell case. With the carbon electrode prepared and all the other components ready, we can now assemble our supercapacitor coin cell. Starting with the bottom half of the coin cell case, a stainless steel spacer is first placed inside to protect the electrode and support even compression between the various components. The first electrode is then placed on top with the current collector side in contact with the spacer. This is followed by the semi-permeable separator which is then wetted with the electrolyte. The separator ensures there is no direct contact between the electrodes that would cause a short circuit while still allowing the flow of ions. 
The other electrode is then placed on top, followed by another spacer. A stainless steel spring is then added to further aid the compression and thus increase the contacts between the components. The top half of the coin cell case is then placed, enclosing all the coin cell components. The final step is to crimp the coin cell, hermetically sealing it, preventing any leaks or contamination. Now we have produced our coin cell, let's go and test them. First we subject our coin cells to galvanostatic cycling, charging at constant current and measuring the voltage that builds up across them. A good supercapacitor has the following features, a long self-discharge time so it can store energy for longer, a small equivalent series resistance or ESR because that dissipates energy as heat, and a slow discharge at reverse current indicating higher capacitance. But all this assumes a simplified circuit. To dig deeper we need to use electrochemical impedance spectroscopy. From this we get the device impedance for a range of driving frequencies. An equivalent circuit model can be fit to the data, giving us information on internal charge transfer mechanisms within the device. But what if we want to know about the surface of the electrodes themselves? For that we use scanning electron microscopy. We can examine images of the electrode surface for porosity, binder distribution and surface damage from repeated charging and discharging of the supercapacitor. Now when we try to make improvements, by using different electrode or separator materials, or different concentrations of electrolyte, these characterization techniques let us know if we're heading in the right direction. Coin cells are good for small lab scale testing. The standardized package allows us to compare the devices we make, but the capacitance is too small to be useful. When we've optimized the materials in our coin cells, we could scale up to make pouch cells, or even larger sheets of electrodes and separators, which can be rolled up into a can shape or folded or stacked in many layers.